and welcome to another edition, another edition of Transformational Astrology. I'm Henry Seltzer. And uh, boy, we really want to talk about a powerful lunation coming up this weekend, this time which is quite transformational in its nature. Uh, quite transformational because of the emphasis on Saturn and Pluto. And you know, the little background is that Saturn and Pluto came together January 10th of this year, which is also when COVID began, uh, officially named COVID-19, on uh, identified as a disease from the new uh, novel coronavirus that was discovered. Uh, actually named on January 7th, so it's pretty darn uh, close coincidence to the actual timing of the of the in conjunction, the beginning conjunction. Now, uh, at this point, uh, Saturn and Pluto are no longer very close together. I mean, not a matter of only two degrees or something, as it has been for a lot of the summer. But it is amped up because uh, Jupiter is in the middle of it. And we'll be taking a look at that. Now, all the new moons recently have actually triggered, especially the previous new moon of mid-October, really triggered the forming, um, well, it's been around for all the, all the year, really. And one thing that happened was in, in the summer, it really started to amp up, and there was this T-square from Eris and Haumea, new planets, to the position of Saturn and Pluto in the sky in Capricorn. And I was wondering if it was an indication that the COVID um, situation was going to develop into a worse situation over the summer, and sure enough, it did, what they call the second wave. And then, um, of course, this this November, December, well, October, November, December time frame has been another real um, peak of, of Saturn and Pluto, and I'll show you exactly what that means. Let's go take a look at the chart. So here's the chart for this new moon. <clears throat> and the first thing you might notice is the T-square is still alive and active. Um, let me just point out this 22 degree uh, position of Venus in Libra near Haumea, which was the most important factor in the T-square for a while there, but it's now it's moved on. And you'll note that uh, Venus at 22 degrees of Libra is exactly opposite to Eris. This is Eris at 23 degrees of Aries. So that is still a perfect T-square to the 22, 23 degree mark of uh, Pluto, where, where it also is joined by Jupiter now. And the Pluto-Saturn is a little bit further apart, but it's still only four and a bit degrees. And now we have Jupiter in the middle. So this is the timing that um, my friend Daniel Giamario um, called a 2020 summit back in, in a few years back, three years back, and said that, um, you know, we wanted to talk about this because we were having this triple conjunction coming up. And I was able to contribute that, as a matter of fact, yes, triple conjunction of uh, Pluto, Jupiter, and Saturn, and then also that Eris was going to be in square to that position. And now, of course, uh, the previous new moon was at 23 degrees of Libra, right, right here. So that made a T-square, the October 16th new moon. And this new moon, coming along this weekend, late night of... It's, it's about 9 p.m. on the West Coast, um, 12 a.m. on the East Coast, which will be already Sunday. So it's the 14th and the 15th, this new moon. It's the, really the early morning Sunday that it will be noticeable. Uh, but it, it's exact on the West Coast at, at 9 p.m., 9.07 p.m. It does have uh, Venus in this same position, and it does have another 23-degree new moon. This time it's a sextile between these two positions. So we have the new moon amping up the Jupiter, uh, and by extension, the I'm sorry, the, I meant Pluto, then Jupiter, and Saturn. And then we have, um, you notice that Haumea is still at 27 degrees, so it hasn't gotten beyond the position of Saturn by degree. It's beyond, it's almost 28, but... Uh, so that's perfect square. So that's still contributing. So, and then we have not only that we have also to remember, Mars is actually by the time of the new moon just turning to direct motion. So this is a brand new uh, direct motion of Mars, meaning it's really stationary in the sky at this point. You know, it comes to 15 degrees on the 13th, the day before Saturday, and it will. Uh, at that point station direct and then it will be moving forward again and we'll eventually get to the 23 mark of this Eris 
very interestingly, um, it does that just at the December 21st solstice, which is also featured by the fact that Saturn is now at zero degrees of Aquarius joined by Jupiter, the Jupiter-Saturn conjunction, what the ancients used to call the Great Conjunction, uh, which every 20 years, and it will be at zero degrees of Aquarius, as a matter of fact. And I will be giving a talk um, with my friend Katarina Vestblik uh, from Norway uh, on the 13th of December. Uh, and it will be, you know, about a month from now. And it will be uh, re regarding what we can see in this uh, amazing uh, timing of the solstice. That is to say, the sun will be right at the zero point of, of Capricorn. And this zero degree Aquarius, which brings in the whole air sign. It's the first time in, in an air sign uh, for, for uh, 200 years that it stays in the air sign. So that we think that it's going to be a big deal that it switches from earth to air, from more materialistic practical considerations to more interconnectedness, uh, to more the age of Aquarius, to, for example, the global communications that we have now with the internet, where, you know, your, your friend that you're chatting with might be across uh, the other side of town or might be across the other side of the continent or might be in Europe or, or somewhere else from America. So this is um, quite interesting, um, all these uh, configurations that are coming up. And I want to mention as well that uh, Mercury has just gone direct early November, has now crossed back into, well, it went direct right at the, I think it was 25 degrees when uh, Haumea was right there. So Haumea at 27 degrees now of Libra has been part of this whole fall configuration. And that's a very important factor that I will be discussing when I get to that. It's very important. But just to recognize for right now that we do have this really immense peak really of the Saturn Pluto, now Saturn Jupiter Pluto. And that is uh, really it's connected with COVID. And in fact, we are seeing in fact COVID raging as was said, it might happen in the fall um, all over the world, especially in the United States. Why is it raging so hard in the United States? Well, because uh, it's been ignored by the federal administration. The states have been doing what they can, but the federal, the tone set by the federal um, administration, that the outgoing administration of uh, Donald Trump, has been uh, just to basically kind of ignore the pandemic or regard as some kind of hoax. And uh, it's actually, <clears throat> the hospital capacity is, is maxed out in the Midwest right now. So it's really important to recognize that this, we need to do something. And that's how Eris comes into this picture, because if we think of um, Saturn, <clears throat> Jupiter, and Pluto as referring to the pandemic, and Eris is a big factor in this whole configuration, Eris contributes being a feminine warrior energy for deep soul intention, whatever you have at your bottom line <clears throat> that you cannot not do. Uh, what is your deepest principle? To find that, to act upon it, means freedom. To, to do that means finding your purpose, finding what you're here for. How does that connect up with your life mission, the mission of this lifetime? And really it's a freeing and an empowering thing because you don't have to say, well, gee, there's nothing I can do. The powers that be are whipping back and forth this way and that way, and I'm just a victim. I'm just a passive observer. No, you can actually be an active participant, stating what you really deeply believe, acting upon what you really deeply believe, and doing your best in that regard. And if you can do your best in that regard, you really do feel like, you know, whatever happens, even if it goes bad, even if it goes south, you at least have done your part. According to your inner lights, you've done what you can do. And it's a good feeling because you really do have the power. You know, collectively, uh, the society is made up of individuals. Collectively, you as an individual have the power uh, when you take that uh, position of yours and like a hologram, recognize that you're part of the picture and that what you do vibrates out from where what you do, both by uh, just energetically and also by uh, the results of your actions. You know, so doing what you can do and then the question becomes, can I do just whatever I feel like I can do? And no, the answer is it has to be also in accordance with what we call natural law. It has to be in accordance with the inner principles of what makes right relationship. You know, I mean, it isn't just that you can do any old thing in, in terms of relationship. You can't shout or berate the person 
I mean, you can, but it doesn't get you where you want to go. You know, it's not uh, productive. It's not enhancing the long-term situation. Certainly, uh, physical abuse would take that beyond that, or sexual abuse too. So you have to actually adhere. You can't just do whatever it is you feel inside. If that is not in accordance with natural law, it really has to be in accordance with your soul's intention. And that does get back to higher purpose. Uh, we all have uh, an inner angel guide um, that's within us, or you could call it God, or you could call it the universe, and you could say we are subject to um, a higher power, you could say, too. And that, that we have to align ourselves, you know, whatever way makes sense to us, and it has to make sense to each one of us individually. It's not uh, going along with the institution, whatever that might be. It's really finding your own purpose within the society that adds to the society, it may not actually match what everybody is thinking. You know, the consensus reality is not always the reality. And so you have to separate yourself from that. You have to discern, apply discernment. And uh, we do have a lot of Neptune in the sky right now as well. Neptune can refer to spiritual um, connection, to recognizing the basic truth that we're all the same. We're all one. We're all the same. There's only one of us here, they say, right? Uh, but it's also beyond being a spiritual truth, it's also the potential for confusion in the earth plane. And so uh, there's a lot of uh, mistaken ideas, a lot of statements that are opposite each other, and you have to figure out which one is the right thing. Who's saying, who's saying what's true here? How does, what's the true thing? What's the fake and what's the news, right? So it takes discernment, which is where Saturn comes in, a lot of Saturn, um, grounding practicality. And it takes a kind of stepping out from inside of what you believe and what you can come to as your deepest purpose in accordance with natural law. I keep bringing that in because that is the me message of Haumea. So Haumea in this configuration being pretty much still opposite, it's, it was a lot closer before, opposite to Eris and part of this T-square and now exactly square to Saturn at the same time as uh, Eris is exactly square to Pluto, Jupiter. And of course it does refer to uh, how may, as it turns out, uh, one of these new planets, again, it does have to do with profound connection to nature and to natural law, to understanding that there is a moral fiber to each one of us, to the universe, there's a chime there, and we have to recognize that and we have to come to it as, as we can, as we can really identify within ourselves what makes sense within that framework. So that's the substance of what's going on. You know, we all have our individual transformation that we're going through. We're discovering where we miss the mark. Um, <laughs> we're reminded over and over again where we miss the mark. And that's okay, you know, we're, we're trying and we are, as they say, <clears throat> only human. Um, and we can do the best we can. But the keep striving for the best within us is just so important and it's just, it's so important not to lose heart. It's so important to recognize that we're here for a reason. And it goes more, far beyond um, what's going on in politics right now or what's going on in the individual uh, situation that we find ourselves in at work or um, with a family member. I mean, there's a, higher <clears throat> there's a higher vibration to all of this, including our squabbles that we have with our close people and including relationship uh, difficulties and including difficulties at work, difficulties with the whole society, where are things going, difficulties with the economic situation, difficulties with the disease situation, and keeping ourselves safe. You know, masking and social distance have been shown to really reduce the spread of this COVID, and that's what we're up to. That's what we have to be up to for the next six months until, at least, until there is um, a, a greater... Um, vaccination um, that has a lot of promise, but it hasn't even been, you know, released yet, much less distributed, and the distrib distribution takes time. So all of it, we're just in it, you know, and we have to be recognizing that. This is going to be a difficult end of the year, difficult winter, difficult beginning of the next year. <clears throat> and we do have to just recognize that the system is doing what it's what it's doing and it's it's really a good time to reflect it's a good time this isolation or semi-isolation that we feel amongst ourselves and the whole society slowing down it's it's really a good time 
to look inside ourselves and to figure out what it is that we really are up to. Where can we rise to the occasion? Where can we really make a difference in our family situation, make a difference in our relationship situation that we're in? And just, you know, consider that um, within ourselves we know that intuition is very powerful, as actually symbolized by Uranus, which has been prominent <clears throat> in this October 20, October 31st, full moon that just preceded the month of November by one day, uh, that was where the, the sun and moon came to. That was where the full moon resided. The moon was conjunct, exactly conjunct Uranus. And so we're still feeling that as we enter into the tail end of the cycle, as we enter into this next new moon cycle. And we do have Mercury opposed, um, so we do have still a certain, and we do have Haumea actually at seven. How I'm not, this is how may I, we do have Maki Maki, is what I was trying to say, at seven degrees, so that makes an, an angle also, and Maki Maki similarly has to do with profound connection to nature, taking a stand, uh, becoming an activist for what we see happening as far as what we believe to be the actual necessities of life, what, what we see as our, as our powerful mission uh, Maki Maki has to do with sensing that in terms of natural law, natural uh, connection, <clears throat> recognizing nature is a part of us and we are a part of nature. There's no difference. Recognizing the earth <clears throat> as its own entity, as a spiritual entity that we, are, that we have our being within, including society. And recognizing that there's actions we must take in the interest of environmental interest, environmental um, action to keep the earth safe, to keep the temperature uh, under control, to keep the sea level from uh, taking too much land so we have a lot of environmental refugees, all of that. Very important right now. So that that's why these two planets, these brand new planets that were just named in 2008 and 2006, uh, you know, they're fa fascinating and they're important and this whole archetype of getting in touch with nature, recognizing nature is a fundamental part of ourselves and we are a fundamental part of it, is really up for us in this early 20th, 21st century as we go forward. So <clears throat> that's what I had <clears throat> to share with you and I think it's something that could take a moment of reflection. Very important to recognize <clears throat> that we are here for other reasons than we think we are. Uh, the superficial reasons of uh, the job we have, the work we do, the progress we can make, the way we can shape up our house or our, our city or whatever we're doing. That's important, of course. We function on that level. <clears throat> That's, you can't neglect that. Nor can we neglect the physical level of our bodies. We have to eat, we have to sleep, we have to take care of ourselves, we have to keep ourselves healthy. All of that happens on a particularly um, personal level, and, and that's the physical plane, and we have to deal with it. But there's a higher plane to our activities as well. And that's what we have to recognize, that we're part of a bigger picture. <clears throat> this used to be obvious. You know, this used to be the way they thought. In the Middle Ages, it was really well understood that we're part of a bigger picture, that this life was only a piece of it, and it could be quite difficult, but we knew that we had something to go beyond. That was all very well understood. But those institutions, the original church institutions and uh, other re fundamentalist religions, for example, are really kind of um, not, not fully present in their old form, and they must be revitalized in a new way of thinking because we're in this new uh, century and this new um, societal development that we can see happening. We can see the signs of it. We can see the you know, tendencies. We can see how the 60s brought a new concept into being that we could have peace, love, and harmony and interconnection and still have a way to put food on the table and still have a way to keep our territory intact without you know, exploiting uh, the other parts of the society. And that's what we're trying to come to here. That's my belief in any case. Um, I know I've been preaching a little bit. <clears throat> You're getting the gospel according to Henry. Um, and I hope it's helpful. And I guess at this point, we probably... Um, let's see if there's anything else that has to be said about this. 
<clears throat> you can kind of see, of course, some of the, um, you can kind of see all the red, you know, in this configuration. And of course, one thing that happens also is it turns out that um, 24 degrees of Cancer happens to be the ascendant on the West Coast. I like to do charts for San Francisco for the West Coast just to say that, uh, you know, all, all progress is local, they say, you know. So that's our local situation here on the West Coast, the best coast. <laughs> but, um, you know, it just turns out that uh, what's rising is 24 Cancer. So that c contributes another point to this, uh, making it a Grand Cross. Uh, when you consider the ascendant, which we don't want to make a big deal about the ascendant in one particular place because um, that's not where everybody is. Obviously, not everybody is in San Francisco. But um, maybe here it's particularly um, strong, the, the tension of what's going on in the society right now, what's going on for each, each of us individually. As we try to make that next move, you know, as we try to figure out uh, what we can let go of, what we have to let go of, and it's not easy to let go, you know, so they say Pluto comes along like the wrecking ball and destroys everything so that you can then start over. Um, it doesn't have to be that extreme, you know, you can go smoothly to, with a Pluto transit or you can go hard, you know, and if you resist and you say, I'm not going to change, um, eventually you'll have to. They say, um, if a problem exists, and you ignore it, don't worry, it'll get worse. And pretty soon, you won't be able to ignore it any longer. And that's what happens. That's the way society progresses. That's the way um, each individual human progresses through, they say harmony through conflict is the, um, the ray of the earth, the earth uh, evolution that we're on the midst of. And not only is the earth evolving <clears throat> as it does, but we are evolving, we are evolving within it. And just recognizing that and <clears throat> keeping the faith, you know, having the idea that this is all for a purpose. You know, we are here. COVID uh, is a jewel, um, even though it's a difficult, difficult thing. And even though people are dying and we have to be very careful and we all have to do our best to prevent further um, infections, you know, try to socially distance and doing the masking and everything that they recommend to keep the spread down. We have to handle it on that level. We also have to recognize that it really is um, something that has given us a gift, which is a gift of further looking within ourselves to see where we can, I think that's true of everybody right now, that everybody is going through this to some extent, um, self-reflection, self-understanding, trying to see where it is that we uh, need to change, where it is that we need to evolve into the best version of ourselves that we can be. And that's what really all of this massive social transformation with Saturn Pluto this year is all about. So I think that summarizes uh, pretty well. Um, and I'm wondering if we have any questions. Um, did anything come up in terms of questions, Leslie? We do have one question that's come in so far. Okay. And you can ask a question. We have more time. We can talk about a couple things. But what's this one? Um, this person, let me find a comment. Give me one second. Sure. Um, okay. Jay is asking... Um, can you please talk about Joe Biden's and Kamala Harris's natal charts in conjunction with the USA's natal chart? That might be a tall order, but you can do that. You're up for it. <laughs> <clears throat> That's a bit of a longer lecture. I mean, we only have like 15 minutes we, we're going to do to conclude. Um, the other thing being that um, we try not to be political here, and there's half the country that would be saying, don't show me that. <laughs> um, similarly, I don't look at Donald Trump's chart much, even though that's very productive. You can look at, there's a lot of things you can look at there. Um, <clears throat> let's see. I can say one thing <clears throat> about Joe Biden. And this actually doesn't come from examining the chart in connection with the USA chart, although that's a very productive exercise. I recommend it. 
for anybody that wants to check it out and see where we're going and how he fits into this, because he does seem to be the man of the hour in a certain way. He did win the, the election, um, although that's being disputed in some circles uh, for, for a short time, I believe. Um, the um, results seem to be very clear as far as they were very transparent. There was observers. Um, <clears throat> anyway, to say something about Joe Biden, I can, I can actually say something. Um, I can actually say something because it turns out that <laughs> this is going to get me in trouble politically, but I'll say it anyway. Uh, it turns out that the Sabian symbol for this new moon that's coming up this weekend, the 24th it would be of Scorpio. I just looked at this. It is um, everybody coming down the mountain to listen to one man. That's the symbol, quote unquote. Everybody coming down the mountain to listen to one man, which sounds a little bit like the Sermon on the Mount, except that the sermon, this is the sermon at the bottom of the mount. <clears throat> uh, and I, I think of it as a very spiritual symbol because really what we're talking about is, can we pay attention to the still small voice inside of us that tells us true, that tells us what's really going on? You know, you can discern in terms of intuition what's happening now. And I happen to believe that, that Joe Biden is doing a great job of just trying to be calm and say, I am not the president of Democrats, and I am also the president of everybody in this country, America. I want to, if you voted for me, fine. If you didn't vote for me, fine. I want to bring everybody together. I want to work for everybody. And I think it's a very spiritual attitude that he's bringing to the table. I mean, he's, of course, he's a politician. You know, I'm not, I'm not trying to say he's, he's not, uh, but he is somebody that really does see um, the diversity. He really does see the, the wide possibility for um, working together. He's always worked uh, across the aisle with Republicans. He has many Republican friends that they have different points of view, different policies, but they, they agree. Uh, not they agree on policy, but they agree on humanity. He's, all, he's considered a really good man. <laughs> by everybody. And I really think, um, you know, that he, he, he is in the spiritual moment of, of what's needed in this country. Um, and I'm expressing to some extent a liberal viewpoint when I say this. Um, there will be comments. Um, you can save your comments. I understand that there are people who do not think that he's the man of the hour. In fact, they think maybe he didn't even win the election. But um, I think the election was fair, and I think it's going to go forward. This is always the way we elect a president. We count the votes. No indication that there's anything but counting the votes going on in the numbers that have been slowly and painfully drawn uh, in this week that took place after the election. So I'm just saying that um, we can see something when we look at the two charts, but I really don't have time to do that kind of analysis in this talk right now, I could do that in a future talk, maybe for both sides, because we don't want to be picking sides here. You know, I'm not, I'm not trying to say one side is right, the other side is wrong. I'm just, I'm just saying that it, it is seem to be what's happening, and to look at Joe Biden versus the USA, or, or to just to talk about that, maybe to talk about how he is kind of uh, being a calming force, and and staying with his message of trying to work with everybody. And I think that's good. So <laughs> political statement, um, you know, uh, full disclosure, political statement, <laughs> but uh, that's my position on, on how Biden connects to this country right now without looking at the charts. So anything else? Yeah, we have a few more questions. The oh. next is from Stephanie. Okay. When does Mercury go full throttle forward? Oh, good point. Well, I'll tell you one thing. Um, I have. Uh, been somebody that really does adhere to the idea that there is such a thing as a retrograde shadow, which means Mer Mercury uh, was at a certain point in the sky when it turned retrograde, which is around 11 degrees, 40 minutes of Scorpio. And so until it reaches that point in its return to Scorpio, uh, it's really not completely recovered. And some people say, I think this is a, a mistake, and I think most astrologers would recognize this as a mistake. Some people say, well, Mercury just turned direct. That was November 3rd, by the way. 
And uh, so maybe uh, everything's okay now. And really, it takes a while for it to get back to normal. For one thing, if you think about it, when it does turn direct, it's it's actually stationary in the sky. They call it a station. They call it a retrograde station when it turns backward, and they call it a direct station direct when it turns forward. And you know, at that time, it's moving very slowly, and that's one of the peaks of the retrograde period, actually, the station direct. So I think give it. Um, you know, a week or 10 days, um, it really takes a couple of weeks, and it will be the 19th of November when it gets back to that 11 degree mark of Scorpio. So, you know, that's the safest time to say we now have gotten out of the retrograde period. And by the way, interesting, and this is not a political, <laughs> you know, I'm not taking a soapbox position, but the last time Mercury turned direct on election day was 2000. And what was said before then by some astrologers, and they were very right in saying it, was we don't know how this election is going to turn out until much after the 3rd of November because, and then it turned out there was the hanging chads in Florida and the Florida recount, and they didn't know the outcome, I think, until December. So it was actually very um, prescient uh, at that time for astrologers to say that, that when, you know, Mercury is retrograde during the beginning of the election, then turn direct on election day, and we just don't know how long it's going to take to kind of get the outcome. And maybe similarly, right now, I know some astrologers have said, maybe it won't be till the 19th till we really hear the result, till we really get clear on what is the result of the election. So that's something to think about, too. Anybody, any other questions? Yeah. French is wondering if you could talk a little bit about Juno and Scorpio being so close to this new moon placement. Well, for one thing, I would like to display that for you. And so I'll go into the Time Passages software here that I created many years ago, and now it's been developing since then, um, of course, all, all this time. But it, you can go to Chart Points and say, I'd like to see the major asteroids, and that would be including Juno. And sure enough, Juno is at 18 degrees of Scorpio. And the first thing I notice about 18 degrees is that is also the degree of Neptune. So we have a perfect trine. Uh, and it would be a grand trine if we included uh, the ascendant, the uh, Cancer ascendant that I mentioned before as being particularly West Coast uh, phenomenon with this new moon chart. Um, you know, Juno is very close to the new moon as well. And um, Juno we can associate with... Um, it was the wife of Zeus, and the feminine asteroid of Juno is is considered to be a marriage uh, symbol. It's considered to be the relationship between a man and a woman in a committed fashion. And I might just say that also we have Venus opposite Mars right now. And this is very interesting because Mars is just stationing, as I said, so Mars is very powerful in the 15 degree mark here. And it is pretty much still opposite. It was exactly opposite during the quarter moon phase, which was November 8th, by the way, which was last weekend. Um, so this time, uh, Venus has moved beyond, uh, not Mars, of course. Mars is still <laughs> where it was at that point last weekend. But um, having the Venus opposition and each one in their own sign of rulership, Venus is ruler of Libra, uh, Mars is the ruler of Aries. And Mars actually is also the ruler by traditional uh, ideas of Scorpio, which is where we have the new moon. So this is a very Marsy placement. And this again uh, connects up because here we have 18 degrees, so there's an inconjunct. So I think uh, saying that this is a time that relationship is very important is a good thing to say. Um, Juno represents commitment. Uh, commitment, what, is it, what does commitment bring to relationship? It brings, you know, that kind of serious attitude, we really got to work this out. Uh, we really got to make it happen. Uh, we have to compromise. You know, compromise is kind of a negative word. You could say we have to have creative uh, shared energy between the two parties to come to agreements on things. I would say that's a spiritual principle that might be part of the situation, that we have a very divided country right now in America. Maybe all over the world we have different factions. And, you know, the par partly what this whole, oh, by the way, take a look at Pallas, by the way. Think about Juno being part of this new moon configuration because it's only a few degrees away from the new moon. Pallas at 23 degrees, partile conjunct to Jupiter, uh, one degree away from being conjunct 
to Pluto as well. So how does Pallas come into this? Pallas is once again the idea of using our inner wisdom. You know, uh, Pallas is the Pallas Athena was the wise one. Um, she was involved in battle at some points, but she was also involved with wisdom, considered to be the, the wise uh, a feminine archetype. Uh, and also a combination of feminine and masculine, really, because she was born out of the head of Zeus, right? Um, so it, it does have, it has a sense of um, power to it, has a sense of almost masculine, um, I don't want to use those words uh, negatively, but, you know, kind of uh, being being strong in herself, being strong in her understanding of where to go next, and being um, also involved in crafts. You know, she was um, ruling the crafts, and crafts, again, are kind of wisdom of material things, you know, having the best made things, you know. So uh, this is a good time for wisdom. <laughs> you know, it's a really great time to bring Pallas in. And she is part of this configuration. That 23 degree mark is very strong in this whole configuration with, with both Venus and with Eris and with Jupiter and Pluto. So I think it's a, it's a good time for the wisdom of the feminine to come in and assert itself. Maybe we should just give all the uh, uh, kind of uh, power in the situation over to the women because uh, they, they're about the interconnection more than the division. And a lot of times you find that the leaders of corporations that are female, uh, have a, the, the corporation has kind of a smoother sailing, you know, it's not quite so up and down and uh, all around. Usually kind of a positive thing to have female leadership, which does bring in the previous question, because now we have that, um, because we have not only um, a president-elect, but a vice president-elect who is the first female to the, jo to the job. You know, the first, she broke the glass ceiling, they say, in that regard. Uh, stepping into the corridors of power could even become president if, God forbid, something happens to Joe Biden along the way. Uh, could become president in a future time, who knows. So, I mean, that's kind of a big deal to have women, and this comes back to Iris, which is a feminine warrior, and ever since Eris has been discovered, the feminine, the feminine powers have been on the rise. You know, you see women in office. Many women ran in 2018. You see women CEOs become much more common. Um, women in leadership positions uh, basically is on the rise. And um, you know, I saw a book <clears throat> cover that was it's kind of a popular book of pictures, and it says "Strong is the new pretty." <laughs> and I think that's true. I think women are really taking their power. It's good to see these feminine asteroids emphasized in this new moon chart that is a very fundamental new moon chart for the conclusion of this year, which is such a powerful year of change. So that was a good question. Anything else? There are a few more questions, but I am aware of time. We're coming up on 145, so I just wanted to leave it to you whether you want to take more questions. Or... I'd like to take them, and we'll, we'll try to keep it short, though. Thanks for the reminder. Mm -hmm. Okay. The next question we have is from Waldemar. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Um, let's see here. He asks, of all those new planets, which one do you consider more important to follow in the chart? All the new ones. Well, I, I think that there's a lot to be said about Eris. I mean, Eris is just so fundamental to our entire... Well, for one thing, uh, just looking at it from the astronomical standpoint, uh, Eris is arguably more important of the four planets that have been named. Uh, that are, they're KBO objects, uh, Kyber Belt objects. Um, so, you know, you could, you could almost say that Eris might be more important than Pluto because of its power. Of course, Pluto, we have this long tradition of understanding how important it is in charts, and we're not going to neglect that. So Pluto and Eris both are very powerful, very important, and you have to give a little bit more credit to Eris. These new ones, though, Haumea and Makimaki, are also um, incredibly important in charts, and the connection between us and nature is really, it's incredibly important, and it's something we're just really kind of coming into. You know, Joseph Campbell uh, was a person that had a very strong Haumea, and when I started looking at that and looking at his life and realizing that he said, uh, you know, he was a student of mythology, and he said that mythology, the purpose of mythology, student and exponent and expert in mythology, that he was, um, the purpose of mythology was what he always said, 
was to connect us to nature. And I think that's very pow powerful, and we need that. You know, his, his other comment was, we need those myths in our time. What are, what are our myths in our society now? What do, what do we have that, that can serve that purpose? And of course, astrology is one of those uh, things. So I guess that's the short answer there. Oh, very good. Well, I can answer that question. I think it's a really good question. So we use, uh, in the Time Passages software, we use colors to have a, convey a meaning. A lot of times people just put color in the chart, but we try to use it to convey um, an actual semantic content. And so, yes, you do see that uh, here's Sag near the top of the chart, and it's red. And we're using whole sign houses here, so the entire sign, the entire house is the same sign. So here we have the red for the fire element. We have green for earth, which Capricorn is an earth. We have yellow for Aquarius, which is uh, an air sign. And we have blue for water signs like Pisces and like Cancer and like Scorpio, where we have this new moon. So that's the way we use the, the colors in terms of elemental references. We also use it because the squares and the oppositions are more dynamic, and that's where you see all this red. The squares between, we have Eris exactly square to this uh, particular part of the, of the whole situation up here to have Pluto and Jupiter together almost the same degree, only like half a degree separates them, right? Uh, so that square uh, is considered an, uh, more of a tension, more of what's it called a dynamic, dynamic aspect. And the other ones you see, here's the green color we use for sextile, here's a blue color we use for trine. So here we have easier connections. So between the idea of Juno and the idea of a spiritual connection uh, to everything being Neptune, we have that e kind of easy connection of a trine. And then we have the sextile between this new moon and this Saturn-Pluto uh, Jupiter combination, which maybe means that we, we can start having an easier time. Maybe if we take these spiritual principles seriously and really pay attention to what our inner voice is telling us, we can come out okay. Uh, so that's where you see all the red though. It's, and then this opposition from the ascendant is also part of, so it's a huge, huge uh, counting of Venus at 22 of Libra. We have this kind of huge uh, grand cross in the sky right now. With, I mean, when I say right now, I mean when, when the new moon comes over the weekend. So, yeah. So, good. I think that summarizes everything. And um, we did want to say that we have the Time Passages software, the middle. Uh, we have the basic edition, the standard edition, the advanced edition. And the standard edition is the really good one to have because it does a lot of stuff, including you can have all the reports. You know, um, you can do uh, reports based on... Um, Oh, I see. I don't want to go too far into it, but we have all these different reports, compatibility relationship report. Those are both on sale right now, and they have great interpretations, and then solar returns as well. And so there's a lot you can do with software, and with a standard edition, you can have the reports as part of it. So they are on sale, and we're trying to uh, spread the news about astrology, get people interested. It's a great learning tool. Um, what else? Um, yeah, we try to bring this information, you know, to just kind of make it more clear that astrology works and it's really vital to helping to understand where we're at and uh, what we can do with it. So thanks for your attention and the great questions and uh, see you next time. Best of luck with all. I'll switch back. Wait a minute. Switch back to the other view and just say that uh, very much appreciate um, People just trying their best, you know, learning what they can about the way the universe works, astrology works, and that's a remarkable thing. It tells us that there's a spiritual component to what we do, that there's magic afoot. You know, how can astrology work? These big, huge, massive bodies moving around and all around the uh, sky, you know, and encircling the sun. And by George, it works. So that's really pretty wonderful. And... Um, uh, it's a great study and it does inform your own individual um, understanding of yourself and what's going on in the society as well. So um, hope that's helpful 
and best of luck with what we're up to as a society right now. And uh, see you next time. Bye, friends.